Babies Behind Bars, a prison nursery for Wyoming, next on Wyoming Chronicle. Hello, I'm Richard Ager. Welcome to Wyoming Chronicle. One of the biggest factors in the cost of our prison system is recidivism. That is, when inmates have served their sentence but end up behind bars again. Corrections experts around the country are looking for ways to reduce recidivism. On this program, we're going to look at a new approach to keeping at-risk youth from ever getting caught up in the prison system. But first, we start with this story about keeping families intact, even when the mother is serving a sentence. Behind these walls, year after year, more and more women are serving time. Across the nation, since 1980, the number of women in prison has grown more than 800 percent. In Wyoming, there are 226 female inmates, a total expected to reach 260 by 2015. I think a lot of contributing to it is the uh, increase in the substance abuse laws and some of the mandatory sentences as women become more uh, a part of the criminal justice system from, from those two, for those two reasons. And inevitably, some of those women are pregnant. Kathy McDowell spent four months in the medical facility at the men's prison in Torrington, waiting for her baby to be delivered. How long did you have Jeremiah? I had him for 24 hours the minute I had him. I almost had him in the jail, actually, so it came close. <laughs> 24 hours and then, then off he goes to, to another family. person's care. Yeah. What's that like? It's really hard. Um, I didn't want to let go. But with nowhere for mother and newborn to live together, both must live apart. And a lot of those children end up in foster care or situations like that, detached, sometimes feeling abandoned. Uh, and that can lead to a lot of other social problems. The child can be have problems in school have problems with mental illness and depression, have problems and, and then get involved in the criminal justice system later on, and we see those people back in prison. The solution, build a prison nursery in this unused prison building. This is going to be turned, it doesn't look like a nursery right now. Yeah, this is the old ITU unit of the facility. It's originally when the rehab is done, it will be a home-like environment, albeit with security cameras. Yes. So what do you suppose will be over in this area here? Mostly these walls will come out and uh, this is going to be opened up. There'll be some, a couple of uh, inmate rooms back here. What we're trying to do is fashion the program to be a child sensitive program. And that means that the focus really, even though it's a mother child program, the focus really will be on the child uh, because we want the child to, to bond with her mother and have a, have a very good outcome. Uh, for both of them, but primarily for the child. So the child's going to get good health care, good nutrition, uh, and be with the mother and get well taken care of. One more thing, the million dollar nursery will actually save the state money, which Warden Meyer experienced firsthand in the Nebraska prison system. There was a 16 percent uh, overall recidivism rate as compared to a 50 50 percent overall recidivism rate among the inmates in general population. So those that participated in the nursery program, uh, the recidivism rate dropped uh, more than half. Vanessa Supatra had served her time, but landed back in Lusk for a parole violation. When you got here first, where were you at? Um, I guess you could say I was, I didn't understand. I was really mad. Um, I wanted nothing more but to be at home with my girls. But Supatra's time at the Wyoming Women's Center has changed her. She welcomes the nursery for other inmates, though it was too late for her, and for what it means. Speaking as a mother and speaking as someone that went through and had to struggle with the fact of only being able to spend three days with your newborn baby before you had to walk away from it. Um, How tough was that? It was very tough. Um, <laughs> I don't wish it upon anybody and this would be something that would be so amazing for women. Um, it would help tremendously. Um, it, wouldn't, it, would be, it would just be so amazing, give somebody so much hope, 
like nobody has forgotten about them you know just because you're incarcerated you can change you can be a better person so when you heard that the state legislature and the governor mm -hmm. said yeah let's spend more than a million dollars so that this can happen what did you what was your reaction when you when you heard that for the first time it made me believe in mankind it made me believe in people um, because not a lot of people think that we deserve something like that and not all of us are undeserving. Um, it was just really amazing because for us it gave us a lot of hope to be able to think, hey, a complete stranger, someone that doesn't even know me can believe in me. I can believe in myself and I can, I can do this, you know. I feel so happy for these women that come after me that are going to be able to experience that. And I hope that they really treasure it and be able to, um, I guess, be grateful for it. Even though I didn't get to experience, I'm very grateful for it for others. The bid for the prison nursery has been awarded and construction should begin early in 2013. When it is completed, Wyoming will join 11 other states in providing a new head start for incarcerated mothers and their young children. But when it comes to older children, Wyoming has the second highest juvenile detention rate in the country. Our next story deals with a new approach at keeping at-risk youth out of prison. It's called the Second Wind Program, and we hear about it from Wyoming Chronicle contributor, Margaret Benson. Welcome, Lynn, to Wyoming Chronicle. Thank you. So let's begin by, um, let me ask you, what is the purpose of the Second Wind Project, and who is it designed to help? Well, I think the purpose of the, of the project from a federal level is that it was a grant issued by the Department of Labor, and I think their intention was twofold. Uh, one was to provide more skilled workers, which we're in great need of, but I think secondly, it was to focus on how can we take at-risk youth and put them into a situation where we have an intervention, educationally and vocationally, that prevents them from reoffending and and helps them become, you know, productive citizens and workers, so. Well, you're the Dean of Workforce and Community Education Department at Central Wyoming College here in Riverton, Wyoming. And you're also the recipient of the 2011 Outstanding Individual <laughs> Performance Award from the Wyoming Workforce Development Council. So you're very accomplished in this yeah. area and already obviously have lots of success. How is collaborating on a project that involves workforce, obviously, and also young people that have been in trouble with the law, how is that a new or different collaboration for you? I, I think it's very um, unique and probably one of the things that really attracted me to the opportunity. Um, certainly we work with a lot of youth and young people here at the college in general, but I think there's a population that's um, maybe not served as well as they could be in terms of taking those, those students who have had problems in the past um, maybe made some errors or mistakes in judgment in the past and, and being able to really give them a second chance and put them into a program that is really very comprehensive and has a lot of different kind of wraparound services that support them so that they can be successful. And, and that was really exciting for me. Have you worked in the juvenile justice segment of, um, of, of in Wyoming before? I have not. Um, I have not. I have uh, twin teenagers myself, ah. and certainly seeing their friends and being around young people as well as, again, here at the college, I think that you, you meet a lot of students who have been involved in kind of juvenile services, mm -hmm. um, have had minor offenses, and I think being able to see that maybe they lack some of the family structures or systems mm -hmm. that some of us have enjoyed being able to bring that to them here at the college I think is something that this provides us an opportunity to do and I, th I think it'll make a difference in their success. Now the Second Wind Project, that's an intriguing name. Tell me the background <laughs> behind that name and the inspiration behind that name and why did you call it that? Well, I think, first of all, I think we all know what it's like to catch a second wind. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the energy and the drive that comes with that burst of energy that you get when you're given a second chance and kind of that second opportunity. Um, and so that, that certainly was part of it. I think the idea of, of giving people second chances and, and even just the idea that we're surrounded by the Wind Rivers and, Absolutely. and we're serving the Wind River region um, played a part of, of the whole concept of just second wind. 
you. And we're going to talk in just a moment about the details of the program, but, but provide the larger backdrop for the need and the current issues that made developing this program timely or urgent. Okay. Um, well, here in Wyoming in particular, although I don't think it's unique to the nation, is that we obviously have youth who struggle with alcohol um, and drugs and related offenses. It seems like if you, if you talk to almost any chief of police, they're going to tell you that alcohol and drugs are typically related to even shoplifting and, and other offenses um, that juveniles or youth are involved in. And so we have that issue, uh, certainly in this community. As a matter of fact, I think here in Riverton, uh, we actually were rated as having the highest crime rate in the state. So I think this area is certainly an important um, priority and a, and a relevant area for us to launch a program like this. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the, the picture then is if we can help people who have been in trouble as a juvenile, so targeting 14 to 17 year olds that were in trouble in that age group and they're now 18 to 21 years of age, right. if we can catch them in this kind of narrow window of time and provide them with uh, counseling and guidance and mentoring and support along with a, a rigorous academic and vocational program, I, I think we can change the trajectory of their life. Mm -hmm. I think we really can change the course of their life if they're willing to kind of dedicate themselves to that. They'll have all the support and resources to make that happen. The statistics show that you actually, if you do nothing with those, those youth and they're now 18 to 21 years of age, about 70% of them will commit adult offenses. If we intervene, they think that statistic will go down to about 30%. So, you know, if we can prevent these young adults from entering and ending up in the adult system, I think it's a huge accomplishment. And not only will they not end up there, I think they'll be part of, of our communities and our society that really contributes and, uh, again, provides us with a very needed, skilled labor force. How does Wyoming compare with the natural statistics, the natural statistics in terms of, of um, juveniles reoffending re at an adult, an adult age? You know, I, um, I spoke with our Department of Corrections about that issue, and we don't have very clear statistics. Wyoming is a little bit unique in how we handle kind of our juvenile system. Um, we actually run many of our, our juveniles through our regular court system versus a juvenile system. Mm -hmm. And so um, even though they're 15, 16 years of age, those offenses are, are tracked or counted, much like an adult offense. So our statistics aren't, aren't real clear about it. Um, from just research that I did in writing the grant, it's clear that, again, Fremont County, the Wind River Indian Reservation, um, we have serious we have serious issues here, and we have a very significant population that have found themselves in kind of that category of, of some involvement in the, in the youth. And being in trouble systems. with the law exactly. at some level and in exactly. some way. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the Second Wind Project program. Yep. Um, when and where is it scheduled to begin? Well, we're going to launch our first classes in January. Um, we will launch one here in Riverton that will be focused on a customer service curriculum as far as the vocational kind of category. That curriculum is designed to help people that want to work in tourism, hospitality, sales, any of the service sector jobs. Um, the local casino is a large employer here. Mm -hmm. um, and then we'll launch a second program in January in the Lander Sinks Canyon Center that will be focused on a facility maintenance technology. Right. And that's a program that's a little bit of everything. They learn a little electrical and plumbing and carpentry and and a, a broader base of skills. Mm -hmm. No, so there's three different areas, and mm -hmm. why were these particular areas chosen for the, the educational directions or strands for this program? Thanks. Okay. The third area I didn't mention is uh, Foundations of Energy, and that one's tailored to uh, really help people gain the certifications and credentials they'd need to work in the oil and gas or the energy industry. And so obviously, I think the three areas were selected based on job demand. Mm -hmm and really looking at what are the employment opportunities here in our area, because a, a critical part of this grant is not only do they attend college on a full-time basis, the last two months of the program are focused on job placement. So the, the ultimate goal of the program is not only to impart skills and, mm -hmm. and uh, help them attain 
the, the necessary job skills to be successful, but to help them actually obtain employment. So we'll be helping them to get jobs in those industries. Okay. So there is certainly vocational training as part of this program. And then what are the other directions that you are going to employ in this program that will help these students succeed and not, not to reoffend and go back into the criminal justice system? You know, I think, that's, I think the other part is probably the part I was most excited about because traditional education focuses on those vocational skills. And that's something that we do in, in all of our vocational programs. In this program, um, they funded and encouraged us to really put a lot of life skills mm -hmm. into the program. And so all of the students that participate, regardless of kind of what career field they're going into, will take courses in human relations. So they'll learn about um, not only themselves and what makes them tick mm -hmm. <laughs> and what their interests are, but they'll learn about conflict resolution, communication. Um, there's a course in workplace expectations and you know what is going to be expected of you when you enter a workplace and work ethic as well as uh, we have team building and we have some financial literacy classes involved in that and then another really important component is a service learning component and the students will be involved on a weekly basis going out into the community and providing services to the community so so they'll be able to earn an income at the same time they will um, this program will actually be able to compensate students up to $200 a week while they're going to school. That sounds like a pretty good deal. It's a very good deal. Yes. Um, so not only is all of their all of their tuition and books and materials and and work supplies are provided through the grant, um, they also can earn additional funding and, and income to help support them while they're in the program. And that'll be really important because we're asking them to commit 35 to 40 hours a week every week to this program so they're up here full time and it doesn't really allow for them to have much of an opportunity to earn an income outside of attendance in the program so for that six to eight months it's pretty uh, consuming sounds like you have them very busy and lots of different things <laughs> in a very comprehensive and rigorous approach so let's talk about the individuals who will be selected for the first program are you calling it a pilot program uh, I, you know in a sense the entire project's a pilot in that I think this is a new project from the Department of Labor mm -hmm. to see if we really can have a, a significant impact in reducing that recidivism. Sure. Um, so I think the entire project in and of itself is kind of a pilot to see where we go with this and then what funding will, will kind of follow. So what will be the face of this new class? Who will be in it? What types of folks are you targeting? Age? Gender? Uh, race or are there specific well, targets you are very, for this first class? Uh, very specifically from an eligibility standpoint in the grant, they must be between 18 and 20, 21 years of age. So it's a fairly, for us, it's a fairly narrow age group to work with. So they must be 18 to 21. Mm -hmm. They must have had some prior involvement in the juvenile system. And juvenile system is very broad. It means um, they could have had behavior problems in school and been involved in um, uh, a referral to juvenile services or something along that line. It could be a student who had a minor in possession or a minor under the influence of alcohol and, and was routed through a diversion program and never sentenced. So we're looking for, for people who 14 to 17 had some kind of involvement in the juvenile system and now right. they're 18 to 21 years of age and have not been convicted as an adult. All right, so that, that specific of a group. Right. Now you're gonna bring these students on campus and begin a program that's already within the CWC or Central Wyoming College system, both here at Riverton and in Lander. How are you and the faculty going to make sure that these, this group of kids doesn't get labeled as different or there's a stigma attached to what they're doing? You know, I, I think that's a really important point and it's one that we're very uh, aware of and want to pay attention to. I think that um, we'll be successful in a couple ways. One is even though there are like programs on campus, these students will be run in what we call cohorts. So they'll be run um, in and of themselves as a group by themselves. Um, they'll take all their classes together and they'll have this kind of common experience and, and we think a bonding, a supported bonding right. um, that they'll experience as they go through the program. But we also want them to know that they're very capable of doing college level work. They'll be held to those same standards of doing college level work. Uh, we'll take them on campus tours. We'll encourage them to get involved in the college activities, get them a college ID card. So we want them to definitely know that they're part of our college community and our college campus. Um, 
I, you know, I, I've told many people here on campus, I think if we did a background check on our existing students, <laughs> we'd probably find a very similar population here. Yes, so. the, there's probably a lot of truth in that, Lynn. So you were very successful in getting a very large grant. Uh, tell us about how you got that grant and then um, how that will be implemented on a per student basis and then how will it be sustained as the program goes along? Well, the total for the grant was a $1.2 million grant over the next 30 month period. Mm -hmm. And we're about six months into that, into that grant period right now. Um, it is an expensive program on a per student basis. Yes. Um, this, the grant will serve about 62 students over the course of that. And that what is that months. a per student? That will end up being about a $20,000 per student cost. And right. I know that that's going to be a very controversial kind of issue. Sure. And it's one that I want, I guess, the public to know that we don't take that lightly in that we recognize that we're, we're spending taxpayer money and that um, I'm doing it certainly with the hope that it will be a cost savings. Um, they estimate the cost of incarcerating an individual right now to be about $50,000 a year. Wow. <laughs> Huh. So I think if we can save, you know, a significant number of, of people from reoffending and ending up in the adult system, it'll, it'll be an investment well spent. Um, the, the program, again, over that 30 months, we'll, do, we'll conduct about six different sessions and, and serve those 62 students. Okay. And so how will the success of those students be measured? I think for um, the grant purposes, they're certainly looking at how many students start a program and complete them. Mm -hmm. And so we'll be looking at at least, our, our goal is to achieve at least 80% completion rates from those who start. And then th we'll be looking at how many of those gain employment in the field in which they're trained. And our goals are high for that. We anticipate that we'll, we'll place at least 90% of those people who complete the course in employment in the field in which they're trained. Right. And then our hope is to be able to track them longer term. We'd like to, to be able to communicate and work with those students on a longer term plan to see kind of where are they in a year, two years, three years out. So right, and where are you in terms of uh, recruiting the, the class for next year? We have started inter interviews for that class and uh, we have about eight students recruited right now. We're looking for about um, eight to ten students in our facility maintenance class and we're looking for about 15 students that will start the customer service class so we still have a ways to go. Mm -hmm. And how are you communicating to these students or instilling in them the great opportunity they have and um, challenging them yeah. to succeed in this? Well I think it comes back to um, recognizing really the the blessing that we've been given with this grant in that um, Obviously, you have many people who are out there working adults who are paying their taxes that are challenged with supporting their own kids to go to college. And here, these kids will have an opportunity that, that others may not. And I think it's really important that these students in this program know that mm -hmm. and that they recognize that this is an investment that our, our community is making in them and that they're making that investment and expecting a return on it, mm -hmm. a, a very positive return. And so I, I think that they need to understand where the money really comes from and that it's not just some kind of nebulous, you know, federal funding that falls out of the sky. Yeah, absolutely. These, are, these are real dollars. And, in challenging uh, economic times for the, everyone in the nation. Absolutely. Well. And so, you know, economically for, for future classes to have an opportunity like this will depend on the success of, of these initial groups that we, that we provide. This you, opportunity for us. So. You talked about community. What other partnerships or, or support do you need from the state of Wyoming and beyond to help you make this program a success? Uh, we definitely need partnerships and, and certainly the obvious ones come from the, kind of the judicial side of things. So the judges, the prosecuting attorneys, the defense attorneys, mm -hmm. people who are in contact with uh, individuals who've been in, in trouble in the past. Um, but we also will work very closely, I think, with the Department of Family Services. Right. Uh, Fremont County Youth Services, so school teachers, school counselors, so anyone that kind of has contact with um, with the youth in the in the county, they're kind of up and coming. Okay. So. And what do you see beyond this this first uh, the first development of the program? What does the future look like for the Second Wind Project? I'm I may be too much of an idealist, but <laughs> I'm very optimistic. Mm -hmm that I think if we can create a really positive environment where the students recognize that people believe in them and that they can believe in themselves and that they can see 
the success coming and um, I think that this will really shift even some policies on even a federal level to look at where do we want to invest mm -hmm. and I think the, fun the funding and future funding will probably come from shifting some of those dollars hopefully in the long run that we've been having to put into incarceration and now we can put it into education. Okay. And certainly a project like this takes a lot of uh, personal and professional energy and effort on your part. What inspired you from the very beginning to, to see the vision for this and, and start working towards this project? I, you know, I think I've always had a, a personal mission or vision to kind of come back to Wyoming and, and utilize my time and energy to lift up this community. And certainly the college is a perfect place to do that. And so um, I've had an opportunity here at the college to create all kinds of innovative programs that have worked with uh, people in poverty. Um, and I think this is just another unique opportunity that, that when presented with it, I just, I couldn't pass it up. I just, there's such a need here. There's such a need to serve this, this group and to see if we can't really make a difference. And I, I just feel very strongly that um, when we can surround them with people who care and are really willing to work with them, that it's going to make a it's going to make a significant difference. Okay, so once again, it begins this coming January. Yes. And and runs through what time? Well, I think our last session must be completed by December of 2014. All right. Thank so, you, Lynn. Well, thank for you for coming on Chronicle and telling us about the Second Wind project. Well, thank you. I really appreciated the opportunity. That's all for this week. Be sure to join us for the next Wyoming Chronicle.